amen, amen. How many of you can honestly say that Jesus is the center of your soul? How many of you can honestly say that Jesus truly is the center of your joy? Because there is a difference between happiness and joy. See, happiness is conditional. Happiness depends on what you have going on in your life. But joy, joy comes from a place that it doesn't matter what the condition is. It doesn't matter what the situation is. You got joy because God is at the center. Because God is at the center. That's where our joy comes from, amen? I remember that picture. <laughs> uh, since then, we have, I got COVID hair going on, yeah. Yeah, I, I, when I grew this afro, because, you know, everything was shut down and couldn't go to the barber shop, you, you, you couldn't go get your hair did. <laughs> Not done. I, my wife like proper English. Come on. All right. <laughs> Listen, you couldn't go get your hair done, and so I had this, this baby fro, right? And went to the barber shop, and he's like, you ready to just cut it all off? And I'm like, I think I'm going to go into shock. Let's, let's, let's go... <laughs> Let's do a little bit at a time. Let's, let's take some steps before we get back to the ball fade. And so I sat in the chair. I trusted him. I've been with him long enough to I say, I'm going to let you do whatever you want to do to my head. And if I don't like it, we're going to cut it all off, right? And so this is what I got going on right now, right? <laughs> and and I, I thought I was going to cut it off, y'all, because, I, you know, it, it was going to be phases. I thought I was going to cut it off, but then we had George Floyd happen. And then we had other things that began to happen during quarantine. And as I began to just look at our world and look at what was going on in life, I began to notice how we are continually, as a people, continuing to go through things, but now we're able to see it, right? It's not hidden and swept up under the carpet. And so as I begin to figure out, what can I do to be able to stand up for what is right? And one of the things that we have going on in the States right now is called the Crown Act, where you can't wear your hair a certain way yeah. because it's considered unprofessional, yeah. right? And so because of the movement of black people being able to, to put their hair in afros and braids, yeah. professional organizations see that as aggressive, yeah. right? They see that as somebody that's going to kind of go against the grain. And so I didn't cut my hair, and I just began to twist it up. I promise you I didn't like it. Because my son was doing it, I'm like, comb it or do something with it. Been there, done that. And it's interesting how God will put you in a situation to where the same thing that you was talking about is now the thing that you're going through, right? And so I have my hair, and I can tell you I like that better because all I got to do is get up, brush it, and go. This takes, a t this takes five minutes or so to get it together, right? But this is my COVID hair, y'all. And so standing up for things that are right, I'm like, you know what? I'm in a professional position. They're going to see that. It doesn't matter about your hair. It's about the character of the individual. Amen? Amen. There is a word in the house. There is a word. You can find that word in Ezekiel, Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 47. Chapter 47, verses 1 through 12. Ezekiel chapter 47. Verses 1 through 12, I will be reading from the ESV version. Um, the sermon encompasses all 12 verses, but I will read verses 1 through 7, and then I will skip down to verse 12. Amen. 1 through 7, and then I will skip down to verse 12. Starting at verse 1, it says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, Water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, but the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate 
and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side, going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand. The man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw on the bank all of the river, very many trees on the, on the one side and then on the other. And if you skip down to verse 12, and it says, and on the bank, on both sides of the river, there will, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water from, that flows from the sanctuary, their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, oh gracious Lord, we just thank you for another day of your grace, another day of your mercy. Lord, we thank you for another day of your love. Lord, we pray that as we come together in this place to hear a word from you, we pray that your word will reign true. That when two or three are gathered together, that you will be present. And we pray that as your spirit is present, that you will touch each one of us in a way that as the word flow from my mouth, that it will touch us, that it will strengthen us, that it will build us up, that it will equip us, Lord, that we will be strong in our relationship with you and be able to walk out into this world in a way that we truly shine as living water, that we truly shine as light and as the salt that will season all atmospheres. Lord, we thank you for what you're about to do now. And we will be careful to give you all the glory all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have your seat. <clears throat> all right. So, I think I'm a little dehydrated. I call myself going swish, uh, fishing um, on Friday, and I stayed out in that sun a long time. So, I might need a, another bottle of water up here. I already finished that one, so, <laughs> so I might need another bottle. All right, now. Every time that I would try to sit still and connect with these scriptures, it seemed hard for me to read these scriptures. It, it seemed like it was hard for me to translate these words as I would try to sit and connect. I couldn't understand the scriptures each time that I would try to sit. And I'm going to blame that on busyness. I'm going to blame it on business. How many of you know that when you are trying to do something for God, when you're trying to do something for him that the enemy gets busy. He gets busy in your life to the point where he begins to distract you to where you're not able to reach the purpose that God has for you. Because every time I tried to sit down and study this word and get into this word, I, I wasn't giving God the proper time for God to touch me to reveal the words unto me. And so as I began to read the book of Ezekiel, and try to translate it, I pose this question upon the scripture. And the questions I pose is, do I take this literally or symbolically? How do I, trans, how do I translate this word? Am I supposed to look at it literally or is this symbolic to mean something else? Because if you look in verse 12, verse 12 talks about all kinds of trees that bear fresh fruit every month. Every month. Now growing up, my grandmother, had a backyard full of trees. She had two apple trees, two pear trees, two peach trees, a plum tree, a fig tree, and two pecan trees. So she had a massive backyard full of trees. And every now and then she would say, baby, don't you go out there messing with them pears because they're not ripe yet. It's gonna have you run into the restroom. Don't go out there messing with them, right? So growing up, I learned from my grandmother that there is a season to bear fruit. As in there's a season for fruit to be in season and then out of season. So, so looking back at this word, the word says that there will be fresh fruit 
for food every month. So if we take this literally, does that mean that there will be fruit every single month? And will that fruit be the same fruit? Or will it be different fruit? And then if we look at it symbolically, what does it mean? Does it mean that we are the trees and that if we stay planted by the water, that we will no longer have in season and out of season, that every single day there will be food if we stay planted by the water. So can you see my struggle? Can you see how I was struggling with the word? Because it can be difficult to figure out how to read the book of Ezekiel because he uses symbolism, he uses poetic forms and parables when he's writing his message. So, so, so my challenge this morning, here's my challenge. My challenge is for us to be able to figure out how to interpret God's word for our life, as in how do we step into our purpose for God. In fact, that's my sermon title, Stepping Into Your Purpose, but not just any purpose, stepping into your purpose, your godly purpose for your life, amen? If we look in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel starts about five years after the Babylonian attack on Jerusalem. And Ezekiel is one of the prisoners who is taken away from Jerusalem. And in chapter 1, you will find Ezekiel sitting on the bank of Shabar. And he's sitting on the bank of Shabar. He's about 30 years old. And he's sitting there and he's reflecting. And as he's reflecting, he's realizing that this would have been the year that I would have been indoctrinated into being a priest. I would have made it into priesthood if I was still in Jerusalem. And while he's reflecting, all of a sudden, Ezekiel begins to have a vision. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, he has four visions. The first vision, God um, commissions Ezekiel to communicate to the Israelites that they have broken their commitment, their covenant agreement with God. And he sends them to give them a message that, dest that destruction is coming. In his second vision, in the second vision, it's about the temple. God is telling Ezekiel to go and let the people know that the temple has been, is going to be destroyed. And it's showing in the vision that God's glorious chariot is leaving the temple. And that is to symbolize that the presence of God and that the spirit of God is leaving his people. And then when you go and look at the third vision, the third vision is about the Israelites' spiritual status or their spiritual state. As in, you see in his vision that the Israelites, they are dying off and there are bones. And then you begin to see God's spirit move along the bones and move along the people. And it begins to show that the God begins to raise up a new people. He begins to raise up new life and give them a new heart for God. And then we arrive, we arrive at our scriptures this morning, which is the fourth vision. And in the fourth vision, you see a new temple, a new temple that will bring hope and life for all creation, a new temple that's not just for the Israelites, but a new temple that's for all creation. So if we look in the text in verse one, Ezekiel writes that he was brought back to the door of the temple and there was a water flowing under the threshold of the temple towards the east which was the front of the temple, and that the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, which was the south of the, of the altar. So within Ezekiel's poetic and symbolic writing, he's telling us this morning that in order to reach God's purpose for our life, that is not going to be easy, nor will you reach that purpose in your comfort zone. In studying the text, he's telling us that God has a purpose for each one of us, but in order to reach your purpose, it's not gonna be easy, nor will you find it staying in your comfort zone. So in, in studying the text, in studying the text, I begin to immediately see things pop out, right? I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get it. I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get it. And the two things that stood out was the temple and the water. So as I read the text over and over again, what kept popping out of the scripture was the temple and the water, the temple and the water, right? So let's look at the water. If we look at the water in the Bible, depending on your biblical translation, the word water is mentioned anywhere from 400 to 722 times. That's more than the word faith, more than the word hope, more than the word prayer, more than the word worship. It is being mentioned 722 times in the Bible. In fact, in fact, if you go and look, the word water, it enters the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. 
So in the first book, the second verse, it says that the earth was void and without form. And, and the God covered the face of the deep. And then his spirit began to sweep across the waters. So as we can see, water is such an essential component to life. At least 70 to 75% of water surface is covered. The earth's surface is covered by water. And roughly about 70% of our adult bodies is made up of water. And our brains is 85% water. So water is essential to life. And all living things need water to survive. Look, 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 when we think about the use of water, water has the power to purify. It provides deliverance. Water can even destroy. When we look at water, water quenches our thirst. It cleanses our body. And it issues a source of power that, that creates energy in our lives. Water is essential to life. I'm talking about water this morning. I and mean, if we look at water in the Bible, water was turned into wine. It was used to wash feet. We use it to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if you go and look in Matthew chapter 14, verse 29, Peter stepped out on water and it became a road so that he could begin to walk towards Jesus. We're talking about water this morning. Talking about water. And John, John chapter 7. If you look in chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, Jesus says this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and, and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So what does water symbolize in this text? The water symbolizes the living word of God. It symbolizes the living word of God. God, water that brings blessing. Water that brings comfort. It symbolizes the living word of God that brings protection into our lives. We were talking about water, but now let's look at the temple. Can we talk about the temple? Let's look at the temple this morning. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, temp the temple was a physical building, a holy place, the dwelling place for God. The temple is literally the house of the Lord a holy place set apart from the rest of the world. In the temple, you could worship God and God would speak to his people. If we start in Genesis and work our way into the New Testament, God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He created humanity and they dwelled with him and they took on the image of God. So there was no need for a temple in the beginning. There was no need for a temple structure because humanity lived in harmony with God. However, however, humanity chose to rebel against God. And in that rebellion, in that rebellion, it made us alienated from the presence of God. If you fast forward 400 years later, 400 years later where the people of Israel are enslaved in Egypt. Now they're enslaved in Egypt. They're disconnected from the presence of God. And God calls on Moses and tells Moses to go let the people know that he wants them to build a tabernacle. He wants them to let his people go, but in order to do that, he gives specific instructions. Build a tabernacle, put it in the tent, so that my people can serve me and he can dwell in the place of his people. If you continue to move several years later, several hundred years later, now you will find in the New Testament where John writes in John chapter 1, verses 1 and verses 14, he says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us people, and we beheld his glory. So God walked with us. God talked with us. He broke bread with us. He fellowshiped with us. And what did we do? We rebelled again against God. And not only did we rebel, we sent Jesus to the cross. But thank God it didn't stop there, that the story didn't stop there. So even though we rebelled and sent Jesus to the cross, he didn't stay dead. He got up early on Sunday morning. He rose from the grave. He ascended back to the Father. But the Father didn't stop right there. He sent down his Holy Spirit to dwell with us. He didn't leave us there. He sent his Holy Spirit to dwell with us. So then we moved from physically being with God in the Garden of Eden to a tent structure, to a building structure, to Jesus coming back and trying again to walk with us. 
to now our bodies becoming the living temple that God's present and his Holy Spirit dwells down on the inside of us. See, Ezekiel is trying to let us know through his symbolism that God's presence and his living word, now if you accepted him, is down on the inside of you and he no longer dwells in a building, but he dwells in our bodies through his Holy Spirit. But in order, in order for God's Holy Spirit to dwell down on the inside of us and for his living water to feed us, we have to accept his son. So we first have to repent of all of our sins. We have to acknowledge that we are sinners in need of a savior. And then secondly, you have to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for all of our sins and that he didn't stay dead, that he rose from that grave. And then finally, you have to confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And if you accept his son as your Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit will begin to dwell down on the inside of you. God's holy word will begin to fill you. You will find that quench of your thirst and God will begin to work from the inside out, cleansing you to where you become a new creature. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. All things have passed away and behold, all things are new. All things are new. So looking in the scripture, Ezekiel says in verses 3 through 5 that the man measured a thousand cubits and then led them through the water. And he was at ankle deep. Then he measured again and led him through the water. And it was knee deep. He measured again and led him through the water. And it was waist deep. The man measured a thousand cubits a final time. And it was a river that Ezekiel could not pass through. For the water had risen, it was so deep, it was deep enough to swim, and he could no longer just pass through it by walking. So what is Ezekiel saying to us in this scripture this morning? What is he saying to us? He says, stepping into our godly purpose, it will not be easy, nor will you be able to achieve it in your comfort zone. So then the question may be, the question may be, well, how? Do I apply this scripture to my life? Let me see. I'm going to do a, a quick survey of the room. How many of you have ever been by a large body of water, say a lake, a beach, or an ocean? If you've been by a large body of water, raise your hand. A lake, a beach, or an ocean. Okay, that will help me. Okay, thank you. That will help me see if you resonate with this. So I, uh, <laughs> I think um, I don't really care for the beach. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I really care for the beach. And, and, and I think it's not the water. <laughs> I don't think it's the water. I think it's the sand, right? I think it's the sand because in order for you to get to the water, you have to go through the sand. And the sand get all in your toes. It gets stuck in your skin, right? It gets in your hair. Sand gets everywhere. But... You have to walk through the sand before you can experience and touch the water. Now, 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 once you make it to the water, once you make it to the water, sometimes we have to allow our body to adjust to the temperature, right? And I don't know about everybody. It might just be me, you know. You take your feet and you, like, kind of step in it to see if it's cold. You, you, you want to check the temperature so you touch the water just to see how it is and once you realize that it's not so cold you go ahead and you begin to step into the water and you begin to walk out into the water and as you're walking out into the water the water is ankle deep right it's ankle deep and you continue to walk out in the water because now it's cool especially in Texas with 100 degree weather you got the coolness of the water you see the beautifulness of the, of the beach and everybody around and you continue to walk out to the water and then you notice that it is now knee deep is now knee deep, but you enjoying that coolness of that water, you enjoying the scenery of the beach and you continue to walk out and you're walking out and as you walk out, you realize that now you are waist deep. But it's okay that you're at waist deep because you got that, that, that footing, right? You can still feel the bottom of the beach, right? But what you don't realize until after a while is that you got this pull and this push on your body. As you get to this waist deep, all of a sudden now it's got a push and a pull on your body, but you're okay because you got that solid ground, 
right? You got that solid ground. So you continue to walk out, enjoying the coolness of this water. You enjoy the, the surroundings all around you, and you continue to walk out. And next thing you know, the water is now about shoulder level, and you have to start hopping a little bit, right? You got to start hopping a little bit. That water start rushing in, and you got to start hopping a little bit because you don't want your head to go up under water. But every now and then, because you're there, you're hopping, but you lose your footing. You can't, you can't find it, right? You can't find it. You're losing your footing, and you're going up and down, but that water keeps crashing in, and it's coming faster and faster. What am I trying to say? That sometimes in our life, we find the coolness around us, and we continue to walk out. And it doesn't matter because we haven't felt that pull and that push on our life. And even when we feel the pull and the push on our lives, we okay because we got that solid ground. But all of a sudden, now that water's crashing in and we got to jump up to keep from our head from going under water and we lose our footing. And when we begin to lose our footing at that moment, all these emotions begin to erupt inside of us and fear kicks in. Fear kicks in. And once fear kicks in, we begin to think, have I gone too far? I think I need to go back. It was easier back here. It was easier back here. We have to begin at that moment to make a choice. We have to make a choice. Are we going to go back? Are we going to go back to the level that we have control? Or are we going to let go of that fear and swim in the water? Are we going to let go and swim? What am I trying to say? What am I trying to say? What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm afraid, I'm afraid some of us get stuck in the sand. I'm afraid some of us get stuck in the sand and you don't even get to experience the water. And, and then there's some of us who make it into the water, but you don't make it through the water to the other side because we find ourselves where we enjoying the lives, our lives and the situations and circumstances of our lives, and we don't even realize that we're getting pulled and pushed at, at times. And we continue to walk out into our life, and before we know it, we are being rushed with water, and it's coming at us to the point where we're just trying to keep our head above the water. We're trying to keep our head above the water, and we're feeling the pressures of our situations and our lives. Yeah. And I'm afraid some of us are stuck. Some of us are stuck right now. We're stuck right now. Stuck in our fear. We're stuck asking questions. Questions like why? Why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me, Lord? Questioning like your ability. Am I good enough for this? What if I fail? We get stuck in the sand or stuck in our ankle deep, knee deep, or waist deep dedication to God. We get stuck to the point where we begin to question God. Why are you putting me through this? Where are you, God? Some of us are stuck in our situations. And God wanted me to come by this morning to say that stepping into your purpose will not be easy. Stepping into your purpose will not be easy. And you can't just look and listen to the water. Just like you can't just look and listen to God's word. If you're going to step into your question, if you feel like you are stuck in the sand, you have to be able to experience the water. You got to step into the water. You got to go through the water just like you got to step in to God's word and go through God's word if you want it to change you and change your lives. The river was not something that Ezekiel simply was just looking at. He couldn't just look at it and think about it. It was something that he had to enter into. It was something he had to enter into, and we also have to enter into God's word. If we want to feel this living water, if we want to feel and have the experience of God's word, we have to go through God's word for ourselves. Not what mama taught you, not what grandma taught you. You can't lean on Mima's faith. You got to have your own experience with God. If you're wondering why you haven't stepped into your purpose yet, it may be because you're stuck in the sand. Or maybe you're only willing to give God knee-deep dedication. Yeah. 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 Ezekiel.
Ezekiel goes through four different levels before he is able to see the fullness of God's promise. Four different levels. He experiences ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and then swimming. Swimming through before he can even reach the bank. So stepping into our purpose may be uncomfortable, but God says it's achievable. It may be uncomfortable. You may not like it, but it's still achievable. And in order to achieve our purpose in God's will for our life, we first have to build a relationship with God that pushes our boundaries. We have to build a relationship with God that tests our boundaries because it's not until the water becomes waist deep that we even begin to feel the push and the pull on our lives. It's not until the waves begin to crash in and come in faster and faster till we realize that we need God in our lives. And so you have to be able to build a relationship with God that tests your boundaries. And secondly, secondly, we must surrender our control over to God. Because as that water began to rise, and remember we start losing our footing, and we start thinking about going back, the water is rushing and crashing in, and we're trying to figure out what should we do, and that fear kicks in. When the fear kicks in, we have to surrender control over our life. Because as long as our feet are touching the ground, we feel like we have control. But when the conditions of our lives begin to flow and we can't stop this water from coming, and some of us are taking water in and we're choking and we're trying to figure it out, that's when we finally believe that we need to let go control and give it to God. The scripture says that the man took Ezekiel through the water. He would measure the water and then take him through the water. He would measure the water and then take him through. He measured the water a thousand cubics and then he would take him through. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. The measurement never changed. The measurement never changed. The man would measure and then move him through. The condition changed. The environment changed. The situation changed. And a lot of times we feel like we can't handle it, the situation that we're going through, and we feel like we are losing control and God has given us too much that we can't control, but God's measurement never changed. Our environment changed. Our situation changed. Our conditions changed, but God's measurement stayed the same. So stepping in to your purpose may not be easy, but God says it's achievable. But we first have to build a relationship with God that tests our boundaries, that push our boundaries. And secondly, we have to surrender control over to God, allow God to lead us through. And then finally, our third step is trusting in God. Trusting in God. Trust that if God brought you through this point in your life, that he would take you to the other side of the bank. Ezekiel went through four levels. And each time the man measured and brought him through the water. Measured and brought him through the water. If you translate that into God, it's testing you and bringing you through. Testing you and bringing you through. Each time you get tested, God is bringing you through. And what God is trying to get us to understand, that yes, it is going to be difficult. Yes, it is going to be hard. Life is going to rush at you to where you feel like you're drowning. But he says, if you let go control and trust me, when you trust me, God begins to take over. And when God takes over, if he brought you to this point, he can bring you through to the bank onto the other side. Have you ever gotten into something? Have you ever found yourself in something and you're not sure how the story's gonna end? That there's this certain feeling hanging over your head because you feel like that it's not going to end well? You feel like you have been tied up. You feel like you are stuck in your ankle deep, your knee deep, or your waist deep situation. You feel like you've been there for years. Well, I stop by to tell you that God hasn't forgotten about you. I stop by to tell you that it doesn't matter how many people go ahead of you. 
I stop by to tell you that God says that when it's your time, that it's your time, he knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're tied up in. And he says that when you decide to trust him, when you decide to trust him, there's no devil in hell that can keep him from carrying you to the bank of the other side. But it starts with us trusting him. Ezekiel was trying to let us know. Stepping into God's purpose means that you will begin to see the fullness of God's promise for your life. But this journey will not be easy, nor will you achieve it staying in your comfort zone. This reminds me of a story about a married couple, a married couple that went on vacation to Niagara Falls. And they traveled to Niagara Falls from Dallas, and they drove up to Niagara Falls. And <clears throat> Niagara Falls has two sides. It has an American side, and then it has a Canadian side. And so they made it to their hotel, which was located on the American side um, of the falls. And they checked in, and they got up to their room, and the husband kind of unpacked, and then he pulled the curtains back. And as he pulled the curtains back, he was able to see the falls from a, a distance off. And he was able to see Niagara Falls, and he goes, wow. They, they, they had lights all around Niagara Falls, lights all over so that you can see it. And so from a far distance, he was able to be able to see the falls from his hotel room. And the sight alone from a distance off, he was like, whoa. So then the next morning they get up, right? They get up, they have breakfast, and then they travel over to the Canadian side. Now, on the Canadian side, they have a park where you can go and you can see and experience Niagara Falls. And so they are now over on the Canadian side, and the experience is so different. See, because when they were in the hotel room, all they could do was see Niagara Falls. But now they can not only see Niagara Falls, they can hear Niagara Falls. And as they watch this water go over the precipice and falls down into the bank of the falls, they begin to hear the thunder and the roar of the water and the wind begin to blow that water up and it flows across the street and they would every now and then they would get a sprinkle of water on their face. A sprinkle of water on their face. There's another way Another way that you can also experience Niagara Falls, and they call that the Maid of Mist. The Maid of Mist. Now, if you decide to ride on the Maid of Mist, what that is is some little boats that you will find down in the base of the fall. There's little boats down in the base of the fall, and when you go and get on those boats, what they do is they give you a raincoat and an umbrella. They give you a raincoat and an umbrella because you're going to be drenched by the falls because you're so close. Because you're so close to the falls. Why did I share that story with us? Why did I share that story with us? I shared that story with us because there are some people who are satisfied with seeing Jesus in the hotel room. You're satisfied with seeing Jesus in the hotel room. You can watch him from a distance, and you see him from a distance, and you are amazed by him, but you stay in your hotel room. You can't hear him, nor can you feel him, but you're okay with just seeing him every now and then you'll look his way and then you have those people who are not just staying in the hotel room they go and they go out to the park and they get into the park and because they get into the park not only can they see him but they can hear him and every now and then they feel a little something something but oh we got some people who don't want to stay in the hotel room we got some people who don't want to just be in the park they want their umbrella they want their raincoat because they want to be drenched in his glory they want to be drenched with God's presence Oh, I pray. I pray that the Lord will raise up a people who are not satisfied with the hotel room experience. I pray that the Lord will raise up a people who are not going to stay stuck in the sand. I pray that the Lord will raise up a people who don't want to be satisfied with the park experience. I pray that we will move past our shallow point of water and we want to be drenched with God's glory. Give me my raincoat. Give me my umbrella. I want to be drenched with his presence. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a decision to make today. You have a decision to make today. 
in order to step into your godly purpose, you have to make a decision today. Are you going to go back? Are you going back to that level of comfort in your life that was waist deep, that you felt that you had control over? Are you going to stay stuck in the sand and never even experience the water? Or are you going to push forward? Are you going to push forward and push through and let go of that fear and begin to swim with God? You have a decision to make because stepping into your purpose for God will be, will be uncomfortable. But God says that it's achievable. Remember, you first have to accept his son. And after accepting his son as your Lord and Savior, we have three steps to be able to step into our purpose. The first one is to build a relationship with God that pushes, that tests your boundaries. Then you want to surrender your control over to God. Once you surrender your control over to God, you build trust. You begin to build trust because that's our third step is to trust in God. And when you let go of control of your life and begin to let God move you through your life, that builds our trust. And when we begin to trust in God, we can know that God brought us to that point. He will be able to take us through to the other side. And when we release control and trust God, God will begin to show us the fullness of his promises. His promises, his promises. He says that there are trees on both sides and that there is life all around the area, and that there will be fruit every month, not just in season, but every month. And that fruit is available for food. The leaves will not wither. They will be used for medicine. It says that the water and the leaves will be used for healing. But in order to see the fullness of God's promise, you have to get out of the sand. You can't stay stuck in the sand. You can't stay dedicated to God in your ankle deep, your knee deep, or your waist commitment. We have to surrender our control over to God. We have to surrender and allow God to let us swim. And when we begin to swim with God, we let go of that fear. And when we let go of that fear, God takes us through. Are you trying to figure out why your business is not flourishing? You're trying to figure out what's wrong with your relationship? Why your finances won't make it through the month? It's probably because you're stuck in your waist deep commitment to God. But if we surrender our control, if we allow God to test us, and through those tests, that builds the trust. And when we allow God to test us, we will begin to be carried through, and he will take us to the bank where he promises the fullness of life. I started out by telling you about my grandmother's tree and how she had a full um, backyard full of trees. But there is a tree. There's a tree that was, that was put on a hill called Calvary. Yeah. There's a tree that our Savior was nailed to. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. He died, but he didn't stay there. He got up early Sunday morning with all power in his hands. He rose so that we may have a connection with our Father. All power in his hands so that we can fulfill the promises that he has. What if Jesus would have got stuck in the sand? What if Jesus would have only committed waist deep? Because he did say, take this cup from me. If he would have stayed in his commitment to God at waist deep, we'd have never made it to Calvary. But oh, we have a Savior who swam with God. We have a Savior who went past that waist deep commitment. We have a Savior that was dedicated to the purpose that God had in his life. And because of that, we now have eternal life. We have eternal life with the Savior because he didn't stay stuck. Jesus didn't stay stuck in the sand. He knew he had to experience the water. He walked into that water. He didn't stay at that ankle, knee, or waist deep. He chose to swim with God. Are you choosing to swim with God today? We have a decision to make. Each and every one of us have a purpose in God's will. You're trying to figure it out. Why is it that I am where I am? Check your commitment to God. Where are you? 
If you at ankle, that means you got some steps to take. You got to at least get to the knee deep. If you at the knee, you got more steps to take. You got to get to the waist. If you at the waist, you got more steps to take because you got to swim with God. You got to swim with God. If we swim with God, he will begin to show us the fullness of his promises. And he says that there's life on every side. Trees that will never run out of food. And healing in the water and the leaves that will never wither. Make a decision today. Amen. Oh, give God great praise in the house this morning.